the pink sheet. Hey. Hey. So this is little Miss Shay, and she's here, oh, here because mom noticed. I know. You can see this atrophy on the side of the head. It's a little atrophied on the right, but pretty dramatically atrophied. Thank you. So we're looking at Shaney's MRI. Shaney presented to us because. Mom had noticed sort of this atrophy on the left side of the head. The right side was a little atrophied, but the left side was much more markedly atrophied. And um, when we see that, we, we worry about a problem affecting the trigeminal nerve. Um, sometimes it can be something affecting the muscle specifically, but more commonly it's when it's this asymmetric, we're worried about a problem affecting the nerve. Uh, the trigeminal nerve has a couple different functions. Um, but one of its main functions is to innervate the muscles of chewing, what we call the muscles of mastication. And when we have a problem with a nerve, if the nerve is damaged, usually the muscle atrophies. So whether we're talking about your legs or whether we're talking about your head. And, um, dogs have these big muscles on the top of their head, whereas people have really you know, thin muscles uh, right under the skin before the skull. But dogs have these big, thick muscles here. So the trigeminal nerve, what it does is it innervates these muscles. And if we have a problem affecting one of those nerves, the, the muscles will, will shrink or atrophy. Um, sometimes we get other symptoms because one of the other jobs of the trigeminal nerve is sensation of the skin of much of the face. So sometimes we'll notice that the dog, you know, we touch it and it doesn't feel. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll tickle the inside of the nose and um, on the unaffected sides, it'll be very, very sensitive and you know, they'll sneeze and kind of pull their head back or paw at their nose. Whereas we can touch the other inside of the nostril um, on the affected side and they don't feel it. Occasionally we'll see dogs where the cornea um, becomes affected. The, the cornea can get these sort of non-healing ulcers. So occasionally we'll see a dog that's gone to the ophthalmologist for, you know, for this non-healing ulcer and the ophthalmologist will say, hey, overall the eye is fine. We're worried that it's a neurological problem. So in Shaney's case, it was really just the um, aesthetic uh, parts of it. So she wasn't showing signs of behavior change or pawing at the face or any corneal ulcerations or anything like that. It was just the, the head, the muscles are sort of dished out, so to speak. So what we're looking at here on the left side is Shani's head in cross section. So this is the top of her head. Um, her, the bottom of her head would be at the bottom of the screen. The right side is on the right side of the picture. The left side is on the left side. And the first thing that we can see is the muscles just more atrophied on this left side. The next thing we do, or later on in the, the MRI, what we do is we give contrast and kind of compare the pre, excuse me, the pre-contrast MRI to after we've given contrast. And there are a couple things that we can see here. The muscles are contrast enhancing and sometimes um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a, a problem in the muscle, but the trigeminal nerve, which is, is right here, um, we can see when we compare this one to the pre-contrast, it's very, very brightly contrast enhancing. Now, the challenge is normally the trigeminal nerves contrast, contrast enhance even in normal dogs, but when we compare the left trigeminal nerve in Shaney to her right one, we can see, yeah, there's a little bit of contrast enhancement here in the normal right one, but in the left one, we can see that it's more strongly contrast enhancing, it's thicker um, compared to the other one, the foramen that it exits the skull through is wider compared to the other one, and we can actually follow it out here. On other scans, we could see that the muscles down here were already hyper intense, and I guess we can also appreciate um, not just these muscles on the top of the head, but kind of muscles on the inside of the head when you compare the left to the right, you know, this is atrophied compared to there this is atrophied compared to there. So the truth of the matter is, is without a biopsy, we can't be 100% sure that this is 
a cancerous process or what type of cancer it is. And you know, usually I'll say, whether we're talking about dogs or people, whether we're talking about brains, nerves, or skin without a biopsy, you can't be 100% sure that it's cancerous. But the most common thing that we see that looks like this is cancer. The second thing would be a less likely thing like inflammation or infection. Um, we tested for some of those things, didn't come back with that. So what's the treatment option? For trigeminal nerve sheath tumors, it's not really in a place that we can access for surgery. If something was kind of up here on the top surface of the brain, it's easier for us to access. But when we start getting at the bottom of the brain, it's just harder for us to uh, get a lot of visualization. Um, and be able to get down here. It's a harder place to get to. There are some important structures nearby that we want to uh, avoid. And the likelihood of us being able to get all of that is very, very low. So typically the main treatment option is radiation. With radiation, there are a couple studies that, that show that um, it can slow the growth, potentially slow the progression, but typically, we don't expect these muscles to grow back. So even if with radiation we killed all of the tumor cells, which isn't what happened, but in theory, let's say we, we killed all of the tumor cells, usually the muscle does not grow back. Really what we're hoping for in treatment is that this tumor, this mass as it grows, can start pushing up on the brain and can cause additional signs. It can cause weakness on the same side of the body. So sometimes we'll see dogs either when we first meet them or as the disease progresses that the left side, the same side of the body, left side in Janie's case, becomes affected. Sometimes we'll see changes in level of consciousness or behavior just as that pushes up on the brain. It can cause dogs to you know, not act like themselves, just be much more lethargic, um, sleepy, etc. So really that's what we're, one, trying to avoid with treatment, trying to slow the progression till we get to that point. And two, that's the thing that we often tell owners to, to watch out for in the future. Weakness on that same side of the body, changes in behavior. In theory, things like seizures are possible. So prognosis, I, I sort of look at prognosis with regards to, to two things. Um, you know, one sort of, um, I guess the, the short term and, and the long term prognosis. Long-term prognosis, you know, quite honestly, no matter what we do, whether it's medicine, whether it's radiation, um, in theory, surgery, even though we don't typically do that, um, things like the muscle atrophy usually aren't going to get better. Most of the time, eventually, those other symptoms will, will, will come. The weakness on the same side of the body, behavior changes, difficulty walking, plus or minus seizures, etc. We're typically unable to cure this, and this is something that will will get worse in, in the future. In the more short term, um, most dogs can do very, very well, and even in the longer term, some dogs can do very, very well where it's just this cosmetic thing. So they're not you know, painful, their behavior is completely normal, they're walking completely normal, and it's just the side of the head is dished out they look a little funny, but you know they're happy as can be. I've managed dogs for sometimes a couple of years with just medication, um, where those symptoms never never came. So, but prognosis with regards to can we cure it? Can we stop it? You know, that prognosis is not good. But many of these dogs can have a fantastic quality of life, whether it's with radiation or medications. They can do very very well for a prolonged period of time. What we don't know at that time in that one particular dog is when will these other symptoms come about because let's say the tumor starts right here if most of the tumor growth is out and away from the the brain um, we're much less likely to get those effects of weakness on the side of the body on the same side of the body um, and behavior changes but if it's growing sort of upwards along the nerve and towards the brain that's when we, we see those things. She is bright, alert, um, has a weak palpebral bilaterally, not am tetra, intact posture reactions, weak withdrawal reflexes in all four, non painful. Looks lower motor neuron, myasthenia, botulism, tick paralysis, infectious autoimmune. We were worthwhile looking at the seasonality with the cases we see down here. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm 
I, mean, I suspect we see a different population than the rest of them. I feel like it's always this time of year, December, January. able to move all of her legs she's very she's very weak in, in the back legs especially but you know in, in her front legs she almost has like almost like a her her front legs are being controlled by a different engine than her back legs so her front legs are kind of having a short and choppy movement when we're walking they're almost short strided whereas in the back leg she's almost you know a lot more longer strided they're a little bit slower and so based on everything you know her exam her history that you're telling me I'm most concerned about a problem affecting the spinal cord of her neck. Possible problems that can affect the, the spinal cord of the neck, especially in, in older dogs. Things that I think about are um, infection, something such as what we call discospondylitis, which is a type of infection of, of the cartilage and the bones of the spine. Unfortunately, there are other infections that can happen there as well. Um, tumors also can affect the spinal cord. Um, slipped discs, for example, can also affect the spinal cord. Even vascular events, almost kind of like a stroke to the spinal cord, can also happen. You know, the best way for us to see the intervertebral disc <coughs> in the spinal cord is with an MRI. Um, the MRI is the most sensitive way for us to be able to look at all the soft tissue structures because x-rays really just show us the bones that are around it, whereas the, spinal, whereas the MRI shows us what the actual spinal cord looks like, the surrounding structures, even the nerves that come off of it, as well as the actual intervertebral discs. My dog can walk. That's cool. So that's cool. Like after an injection of the injection? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes? I don't know. I would rather, if I was going to be an eight month old dog, I'd rather not have uh, my nice stuff. Yeah. yeah, all the owners are always really worried about botulism. I'd rather have botulism. Just like chill in bed for a few weeks and then you can walk again. Yeah. So we're still in the middle of MRI, but it appears that. This puppy has discospondylitis at C67, so discospondylitis is an infection of the intervertebral disc space and the adjacent end plates. What it looks like on an MRI is we usually have these bright areas at the ends of the bone, so at the caudal aspect of C6 and the cranial aspect of C7. The disc in between is sort of narrowed. The uh, ends of the bones are irregular. The disc is sort of this uh, sort of thin and I guess it has a bit of a not really sigmoid shape but kind of a, a little bit of a curve to it. In transverse we can see a couple things so um, this is kind of right before it. The spinal cord is nice and round here but as we move back through you can see that there's actually material under the spinal cord that's causing compression so that's what's causing the dog to not be able to walk. The bones um, are irregular and have this bright area um, within it. The muscle, that's kind of a nice image there. The muscles below the bone um, are bright, but then there's all this material here. The dog also has a degree of lateral stenosis, kind of consistent with a, a wobbler's. Not for a million years is that what's is that what is causing this? It's the, the discospondylitis and presumably empyema or disc material or something from the disc that is causing compression of the spinal cord. Uh, disco typically caused by infection. Um, most commonly we see uh, bacteria like E. coli, staph, strep. Uh, brucella is one that we need to rule out in that it is a zoonotic potential or has a zoonotic potential. We always think of fungal disease as well. Fungal is a little bit higher in dogs like German Shepherds, like this puppy is. We have a heart murmur. So occasionally the infection uh, that's in the disc is also uh, in other places in the body, not occasionally. Frequently it's in other places of the body. It's usually a systemic infection. Um, but whether it started in the blood and landed both in the uh, C67 disc and the heart valve or whether you know one led to the other don't know. Treatment is going to be systemic antibiotic, antibiotics 
no steroids or anything like that. In theory, because we have some spinal cord compression, surgery might be warranted. Um, that's something we're gonna to need to talk with the owner about. Uh, in this particular dog, unless we find something else, my recommendation is not going to be surgery and we'll be treating with systemic antibiotics. Prognosis for most dogs with discospondylitis <laughs> is actually pretty good, but most of the time we're seeing them with just pain, they're still walking. Uh, to me, there are a couple different factors that affect prognosis. Number one is how severely affected are we? This dog's pretty affected in that she's unable to walk. The second thing that affects prognosis for me is, is it a bacterial infection versus a fungal infection? Fungal infection typically does much worse than bacterial infections. Mm -hmm.